Good morning. I'm glad you're able to take some time this weekend to devote to worship. And uh, as you may notice, this is not where I'm usually presenting on a Sunday morning. Uh, I have had a series of technical difficulties that I, I, I just got whooped by uh, technology today. And I, so I apologize. This is what I'm able to do. I will have this sorted out by next week, hopefully. I do have an announcement to make. Um, as you probably know, we are not having worship in person this Sunday. Uh, that is being driven by uh, our bishop has directed the Methodist Churches of Missouri to, uh, if you were going to have worship in person, to follow the guidelines, which actually line up with what we've been doing already, using masks, socially distancing, etc. But then also to uh, not have worship if the positivity rate for the county we're in is, is too high. And uh, the positivity rate, i.e. the number of people that are getting positive test results back when they are getting tested for COVID is at a fairly high uh, 33% right now. Um, and it needs to be down far, about half of that before we can really get together safely without worrying about inadvertently uh, infecting each other. So uh, we are not gonna be able to have worship and we'll just announce on Fridays, uh, whether we'll have worship for that coming Sunday, and I hope the numbers come down swiftly. I do, before we get into the uh, the sermon, I do want to make sure to say thank you for everyone who helped make the Thanksgiving meal, the Thanksgiving dinner, possible. We served 245 meals, and I can say it was successful, maybe even disastrously successful. We uh, ran out of almost everything at least once. We just... It, it was an amazing event. Uh, thank you for everyone who helped make it happen. Now, because we're not able to worship in person this week and potentially uh, for the future, future weekends, I did ask a few folks to come in and record the uh, readings for uh, the, the weekend uh, for, for that Sunday. And so thank you to the Brody family that came in and recorded. Uh, and <laughs> I recorded these this morning and there was not, not any problem with the uh, the sound system at all this morning. So they have a, here is the reading by, by the Prodi family. Matthew chapter one, verses one through 17, the genealogy of Jesus, a record of the genealogy of Jesus, Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah, the father of Perez and Terah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron, Hezron, the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Amminabab, Amminabab, the father of Nishan, Nishan, the father of Solomon, Solomon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Urah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijai. Abijai, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jesophat. Jesophat, the father of Jehoram. Jehoram, the father of Uziah. Uziah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the father of Manasai, Manasseh, the father of Amon, Amon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jokeah, and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jesaniah was the father of Shelatiel, Shelatiel, the father of Zerubel, Zerubel, Zerubel the father of Abedid. <laughs> David did the father of Elikam. Elikam, the father of Azor. Azor, the father of Zadok. Zadok, the father of Akim. Akim, the father of Eliad. Eliad, the father of Elazar. Elazar, the father of Mathen. Mathen, the father of Jacob. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Thus, there were 14 generations in all of Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile of Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Christ.
in the beginning. Those are the words that begin the, the Bible, the story of God and God's people. And in the beginning, the first words of Genesis are words we've heard many times. I uh, read them and I'm still struck by the, the grand nature of what is described in, in those, those paragraphs. And, and as you read through um, some translations say, God said, let there be, let there be light, let there be sea, let there be land. And let there be it is, I believe, too polite. It is too restrained feeling. The, the, the way it really reads is more of a, a sense of God looking off and saying, sky, and there it is. So God speaks the sky into existence, and God looks down and says, see, and that God speaks the word see, and in the act of saying it, God creates it. God says, land. And so go and every day, just one grand act of creation per day, that we have the, 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 the night and the day and the seas and the land and the plants and one after another. And to, to read this story out of Genesis builds up this sense that what is being created is being created out of God's vast imagination, out of God's vast goodness, and that there's an order to this, that by the time humanity is created in the image of God, that we are inheriting an orderly, an ordered goodness that God has put together and is now going to entrust to us as, as the great gift to us. Here is the gift of life, and here is the gift of all of this creation that God has just spoken into existence. And, and so that is the beginning, that is ordered goodness. And then at the other end of the Bible, the, the end, the, the goal, the, the, the purpose of, of, of us, of creation, is laid out. Is, it comes to its apex. It's in the last two chapters of Revelation, Revelation 21 and, and 22. And John is telling us this uh, of his apocalypse. The apocalypse of John is the... Uh, is sort of the Greek term, the term is, is the apocalypse, the vision that John has, this vision of what is to be given to him as he is understanding what he is seeing under the guidance of, of an angel. And so he sees that uh, there is a heaven and earth renewed, made right, made as it is ought to be, and, and that uh, in this new heaven, this new earth, that there is a new Jerusalem, a holy Jerusalem, descending from out of heaven to take its spot upon the earth, and that through the middle of this city runs the river of life with the trees for the healing of the nations on, every, on each side of the river. That uh, a voice cries out, look and behold, God has moved into the neighborhood. God has made his home among the men and women gathered there, that they are his people and he is their God, that every tear shall be wiped away, death shall be no more, that everything will be made new. And Jesus proclaims that I am A to Z, beginning to end, the beginning and the end. I guess we're talking about Genesis to Revelation, the beginning of everything and the end of everything. This is the end. This is the goal. This is the place that we are directing ourselves to the kingdom of God that is is to come and so we read of this and this this sense of order that the 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 city is ordered and it is so long on each side and that there are the four uh, grand entrances set with uh, precious jewels and this combination is fascinating this is a combination of the the garden at the center with the river running through it and the trees for the healing of the nations right and at the, so at the center of the is the goodness of god the goodness the healing that happens as people gather around following god and then also around the the eat of the garden the sort of garden of eden take two um, is the city which is the city which is the gathering of the people that god has, has created the, the gathering of humanity and the city is sort of the gathered um, creativity and the gathered culture and the gathered art and it's the gathering of all that humanity has made in partnership with God creating because as God creates so thus we create out of using what God has entrusted us with and so we have this sense from the beginning 
to, to the end that there's this order that it was created good and ordered and that we've inherited it as such and that we are headed towards an even greater good and even an order that is truly glorious reflecting both the goodness of God and, and the creativity and the, the virtues and the, the, the product of, of all, all of humanity's creativity brought to bear. And, and so that's the sense of where we're looking at the beginning and the end as we begin this this season of advent the advent is the season um that we're looking towards what's coming next the advent ad uh, is to vene is to come and ad is towards so what is coming what are we going towards where are we going right and, and so advent is, is we're looking at what is on the horizon where where are we headed and as we look as we look at the readings that are connected to Advent, the beginning of the church year, um, they are connected to uh, initially the, the the first coming of Jesus. We are people looking towards the second coming of Jesus, but in practicing looking back to the first coming, it, it helps us prepare as we look towards the, the second coming uh, of Jesus. So as we look back to how the Gospels helped the, the people then prepare for the coming of Jesus, we see that every Gospel helps the people reading it understand who Jesus is in a slightly different way. We're looking at Matthew today, and thank you to uh, Lindsay for being willing to take on uh, what, how Matthew lays it out, because Matthew lays it out with a lineage, and there are some names there, aren't there? Whoa, baby, there are some names, right? So he, Matthew lays out the lineage. Who is this Jesus that we're looking towards? Who is this Jesus that's on the horizon? Who are we looking towards? And the way that we begin to understand who this Jesus is, is we got to understand where he comes from. We've got to understand the, the, this background, right? Because Jesus is going to be the linchpin that allows us to be able to move from Genesis and land in Revelation. And, and so who is he? Who is this guy who makes this, this possible? And so Matthew starts with Abraham, right? Uh, that Jesus goes back all the way back to Abraham. Abraham, who is the father of many nations. Abraham, who, who is receives the promise, right? I will bless you and you'll be the father of many nations and you will be a blessing to the many nations. And, and so then Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and then the, the, the 12 tribes, Jacob and all of a sudden, you know, the lineage starts laying that out step by step. And, and every detail matters in this, every detail. Like, you would expect a lineage given at that time to be a list, just a list of men's names, except it's not. It includes the women who are involved as well at, at certain points. It includes Rahab, who is the foreign woman who helps the Jewish people enter their promised land. It includes uh, Ruth, who was the foreigner who uh, showed great compassion to her Jewish uh, mother-in-law and, and marries Boaz and, and becomes a part of this line of, of then who leads to King David. And so all of the names in this lineage are just names. Only one person gets a title, and that one, one person is, is David. He is not just David, he is King David. Right? And so it makes it very clear that this guy we're looking towards, he's not just from the line of David, he's from the line of King David. Right? He is a line of kings. Right? And so we keep on going down and we go through the, the names of the king, Solomon, Rehoboam. And we finally come to the one event that's listed in this lineage. There's only one event that's listed. And this one event is uh, when it, we read, Josiah was the father of Jeconiah at the time of the exile to Babylon. And then afterwards we pick up with Sheotil and then name, 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 name. And then we end up with uh, and then there's Joseph, who married, who is the husband of Mary, the mother uh, of Jesus. Uh, th it then points out that there are 14 generations between each of these, that to get from uh, Abraham to David is 14 generations, from David to the Babylonian exile is 14 generations, and again from the Babylonian exile to Jesus is 14 generations. So again, it, there's that event there, right? The Babylonian exile. Now, if you were going to name one event in all of the Bible, this would be one an op a solid option to consider because the, the biggest events the Bible tells us are, are besides the creation and then Genesis and Revelation, the other biggest events are Exodus, when the, the Jewish people leave uh, Egypt and head toward the, 
towards the promised land. And then the exile, when they leave the promised land because they have been faithless and they leave and they do not know if they're going to return. Right? The exile is this moment at which they don't know if the Jewish people are going to continue to exist. Right? It's all up in the air. They may come back, but as they're going into exile, like they don't think so. They have lost their homes. They have lost their lands. They have lost everything. They've lost the temple. They don't know if their God is with them. Right? And so they, they come out of exile, and, and then it moves towards, um, towards Jesus. And, and so this is this, the sense of like reading this lineage and, and seeing that the one event mentioned is the exile. It has this feeling of like when, if, you're, if your friend ever tells you a story, like you have this moment where a friend tells you a story, and then in the middle of the story, they like drop a bombshell, and then they just keep on going like nothing happened. Yeah, it's just doing this, 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 this. And you go, whoa, 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 go back. What did you just tell me happened? Like, the, what happened back there? Rewind and tell us that again. Like making light of such a big event. Like if you read this genealogy, like it just plows right through. It gives the the moment in the history of the Jewish people when the fate of the Jewish people was most at risk and it gets like a line and then they keep on cruising. Like, how do we make sense of that? How do we make sense of a genealogy that will mention something like that, but then just keeps on going on? Like it, it mentions it, but it just kind of glosses over and, and moves on. As, as I was talking to a friend of mine about this, uh, another pastor out in North Carolina, we were talking about this sense of, of, of timeline, this sense of, of scope, like this sense that like when Matthew is talking about who Jesus is, Jesus is the one who, who is uh, part of creation, orders creation, and then is, is bringing us towards uh, the future foretold in Revelation, that Matthew is trying to help us understand who this is. But the fact that Matthew is going through each of these names, laying out the history of Israel, laying out like King David and Abraham and, and exile, like it lays out these important beats, these important moments. And it's important to name them to, so that we know who Jesus is. But they are important in as much as they are pointing to Jesus. Right? They, their lives matter because they are children of God and, and deeply loved. And they matter because they are the line of Jesus, the events that get us to Jesus, who matters the most. Every life that came before Jesus in this lineage mattered. But Jesus mattered the most. Like, they're the lives of faithfulness that, that set the stage for, for Jesus. And, and so, such that even when some of them live through the single most devastating event in the history of Israel to that point, when they live through the exile, like, it's not that the exile didn't matter, it's that Jesus mattered more. Because Jesus is the one who it makes it possible to continue the journey from, from Genesis towards Revelation. Right? To have this sense of time and of scale, I find helpful right now. I offer that as the sort of the good news of, of today. Right? That the worst thing that could be imagined at that point in Jewish history, right, the exile, ended up being something that was passing and they just and they got through it and the other side of it it seemed like the biggest deal that could have ever happened but in the end it was just one more thing to get through so that they could head towards the messiah towards jesus and, and that is still true today back then it was true as the people were looking towards the first coming of jesus and today it's true as we're looking towards him returning the second coming uh, of jesus and so this, this, the church here, the calendar, helps us remember this. Like, this is Advent, the season that we're looking towards what's coming. And, and what we proclaim as people who follow Jesus is what's coming is the kingdom of God. That's what's coming. We are headed towards revelation. We are headed towards the fullness of God's will done on earth as it is in heaven. And so this time that we're living through right now, this weirdness, this awkwardness, in the end, it 
is transitory. It is passing. It matters. It's important. But what matters more is the person we're heading towards, what we're waiting upon, Jesus coming again, and that we live our lives in faithfulness towards that. And, and so having this sense of, of time helps us understand in Advent, this is a time of patience. This is a time of waiting. And, and like we're right, right now, as a king, as a nation, as a world, in a sense, we're waiting for something. And what we're waiting for is this COVID-19 vaccine. And I'm waiting for it as much as anyone. But this text challenges me, and I think it challenges us to remember that what we're waiting for in Jesus matters even more. Because that's what's eternal. That's what we're heading towards. That's the kingdom of God. And even the worst thing that can happen right now, even the most challenging moment that can happen right now, is challenging. But it is secondary to where we're headed, where, where we're going. And so I believe that we can be patient in this time. And it's not like we have a choice. We're going to be patient because we have to be, right? But we can be patient in a distinctive way. We can be patient as a people of hope. We can be patient as a people who follow Jesus. We can be patient as a people who look towards the future and know that the future is in Jesus' hand and know that the future is in the I am the Alpha and Omega, right? That, that the future is in the kingdom of God to come. And so we, we hope, we wait as people who have hope, who pe of people who are assured uh, of joy and peace in the kingdom that is to come. We wait as people in the end remembering that the journey we are on each of us individually and as a church, that the journey that we are on is headed towards the kingdom of God. And this is one more step towards that kingdom. And in the end, it is Christ and his kingdom that matters the most. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, as we begin the church year once more, as we begin again turning towards celebrating your birth, as we practice waiting, waiting towards your coming again, please bless our worship. That in it that we might be aware of where we are headed as we follow you. We pray for the health of the nation, not just for the physical health, physical health of the nation, but for the health of the nation's discourse, for the health of the nation's politics, for the health of the nation's trust, for the health of the nation's patience. We pray for all these things as we pray in your name. Amen. I pray that the peace of Christ be with you this day and always. And I also pray that my technology treats me better next Sunday because I, I, I know that is preferable for me to be in the sanctuary and speaking from the pulpit. So uh, I will let you know on Friday uh, whether we're going to be able to gather for worship next Sunday. And... Uh, I hope you have a good and safe week.